Hello everyone, welcome to another Lunch with the Pastor here on our YouTube channel and uh, here on Zoom. I hope that you're having a good week so far uh, and uh, staying healthy, staying safe, all that kind of stuff. Um, I just want to extend an extra prayer um, out as I know uh, we all know what's been going on this week as far as the election and everything else. We're still in the throes at this point. Um, of everything that's stressful and chaotic about uh, the presidential election and all that kind of stuff. We're still waiting for results and everything else. So um, I just continue to pray uh, that uh, the, the right thing happens, that God is in control, you know, knowing we all know that, that God's the one that's in control, no matter uh, who ends up uh, getting his, uh, his name uh, put on the, uh, on the outside of the Oval Office, um, no matter what happens with the Senate elections or anything else, we know that God is the one that's in control. God's the one that's going to take care of everything that's going on. Um, and he calls us to be the church, um, to be his hands and feet, to, uh, to, to live and to love and to be a part of this society uh, the way that Christ would um, be a part of this society. So um, continue to be your loving and wonderful Christian selves, as I know that you can be. Um, continue to pray for our nation. Um, pray for everyone. Um, I continue uh, in this time to, to go back to the words of uh, John Wesley when he spoke about uh, the election process and um, basically saying, you know, um, pray, for, pray for both candidates. Pray for all those who voted, regardless of if they voted with you or against or uh, on the other side of the aisle, it really doesn't matter. Um, all of us are were attempting to vote. We're uh, are, you know voting our conscience, um, and at at the same time trying and doing our civic duty and do and uh, fulfilling our responsibility as citizens of this country. Um, and regardless of and regardless at the end of the day of which side of the aisle we might be on, whether we're going to be elated at whoever's sitting in the Oval Office or whether we're going to be disappointed in who's sitting in the Oval Office. At the end of the day, we're all still children of God. We all still worship him. We all still have the same calling on our lives to be his hands and feet, to build his kingdom and to showcase to the world his spiritual realm, uh, the way Christ did and the way he calls us to do. Um, so, Continue to have that as your focus as we continue to go through these next, uh, probably next uh, week or so as um, as the votes are counted, as the results start uh, truly become more solidified. And as we um, get to that point where we can say with uh, complete affirmation, who will be our next president. And so I just pray that you continue to pray with me. Uh, for the rest of our society as they continue to wait on pins and needles along with us, uh, who that will be, but at the same time, keeping our eyes focused on the eternal, on the thing that's most important, and that's not who's president, that's not who's in the Senate, that's not who's leading the country, but who is leading the country, right? Uh, that, that's God, that's, uh, that's Christ as always, so... Um, Continue to be with, be in prayer with me, and continue to focus your eyes that way. As far as announcements and things, just the house cleaning stuff goes, uh, we continue with services on Sunday morning uh, at nine and at ten forty-five. We continue with re with opening up the church a little bit more. Um, we're con we're just going to uh, continue doing what we've been doing. Again, as I said, it is a slow process. I understand that. Um, but we want to absolutely make sure that we never have to take that step backwards. And so we're taking very, very, very small steps forward to make sure that that never had that that doesn't happen. So um, continue to um, be in prayer with the church and with myself as we continue to move forward, make sure that we have all the wisdom and the right answers to how to reopen so that everyone can remain as safe and as healthy as possible, but at the same time, being able to gather together to worship uh, God together. Um, and then, of course, we continue with this uh, every Thursday at noon with the lunch with the pastor. Um, I think that's about all I've got as far as announcements or any house cleaning that we wanted that I wanted to do. So why don't we start with a word of prayer and then we're going to dive into 
our study of the book of Mark. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to come together to uh, study your word, to uh, hear your words for us, to uh, learn what it means to be a disciple of Christ, to uh, be your hands and feet in this world. Father, as we gather here, we are definitely stressed out. We are definitely worried about what's going on in our world and in our society and our country and everything else, no matter what side of the aisle we might be on. Um, there is a truckload of stress that is going on with everything that's happening. So we just pray that your peace would envelope us, that we would have um, grace to uh, in abundance so that we might not only have it for ourselves, but so that we might extend it to those that are around us um, and that we might be your hands and your feet spreading the message of your grace and your peace to the entirety of the society that surrounds us. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. <sighs> so, brothers and sisters, let's start uh, getting into our study of the book of Mark. Um, for those that saw last week and you saw the caption that I put in the YouTube video of last week, I'm taking these questions from a Bible study that was written um, by Max Lucado. Of course, I'm giving the answers and putting my stuff into it, but that's if you want to know where these questions are coming from or what this uh, or how this has been uh, structured a little bit, um, it's coming from a book called uh, The Gospel of Mark by Max Lucado. Um, it's a study that I've done a couple times for myself, personal uh, personal Bible study. It's a wonderful way to just kind of go through uh, the book of Mark with some um, some ideas, some pinpoint uh, stuff to talk about. And so um, I encourage you, if you want to go on to Amazon or uh, Cokesbury.com or you know anything else and purchase a, a copy of the book and have it sent to your house, it's a wonderful read. It's a really great uh, study to do, um, and it's real easy to do by yourself because all the questions are already kind of listed out for you. Um, and so you can easily do it at your house um, by yourself or with just you and your spouse or you and your family. Um, but that's where I'm getting my inspiration for this study is from that. Uh, as I said, I'm going off on tangents that he might not go off on. I'm talking about things that he doesn't talk about in the book. So that's where I started. Uh, if you're wondering uh, where this study uh, originated from. So today we're going to be in the second chapter of Mark. And you remember that I said last week that the interesting, one of the best parts about the gospel according to Mark is the fact that it is written by a storyteller. Um, it's, a, it's the story of Jesus. Um, whereas the other gospels might give you just, you know, the, the facts, the information, and they're absolutely needed. They're absolutely wonderful books. Not that they're not. Um, but Mark is a true story. If you want to read, you know, it, it, for lack of better terms, it's like the novelization of the life of Jesus Christ, right? Um, it's all the greatest stories melded together so that we can see this incredible and wonderful and amazing story that tells us how not only how the fact that God, how much God loves us, but how far he's willing to go to not only show his love, but to save the creation that he loves the most. So, I mean, all the story that, you know, Mark's not any different than Matthew or John or Luke in the sense that it tells us a different version of Jesus or it tells a different story of Jesus. Of course, it's the same story as the other three because we're all talking, they're all talking about Jesus and his sacrifice so that we might have salvation and, a, and a, 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 an intimate relationship with God. But Mark is one of the, is a wonderful gospel for a number of reasons. Of course, as I said last week, first and foremost, it's the shortest of all the gospels. So if you've got a friend who's never read the Bible or has a couple of questions about who Jesus is, and you don't want to point him to, uh, you might want to point him to Mark first, uh, because it's a really quick read. It's a really entertaining read because, as I said, Mark's a storyteller. So how he presents the information about Jesus, how he presents Jesus's life and ministry is very much in the story format and therefore is 
a little bit more exciting, uh, a little bit more uh, quick on the read. Um, it's a little more thrilling in the sense that you're kind of anticipating and wanting to see what happens next, which is why it's such a quick read. Um, and then, of course, it's also just the shortest of all the Gospels. So um, it's just a quick read in the sense that you don't have a lot to read. Um, so it's always, it, it, when, whenever I'm confronted with someone who has never read the Bible or has had a lot of problems with the fact of they started reading the Bible and they quit, ha you know, at, at some point in Leviticus or Deuteronomy or, or whatnot, I always tend to refer them to read the Gospel of Mark first because that is one of the great, one of the best ways for someone to get really introduced to not only the Bible, but to Jesus himself. Um, is through the gospel according to Mark. And so last week we talked about um, the healing of the leper um, and, and that um, today we're going to talk again about healing, um, but we're also going to talk about healing as it's connected to forgiveness. And we're going to take um, the second chapter of Mark, the first 12 verses as our um, scripture for today. But before we get into that, I, I do want to uh, kind of say a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to break down the story, and it's, it's a story that I think everyone knows fairly well, um, or at the very least, we've heard about it. Um, and once I start talking about it, once I start reading it, I'm sure that it will spark a remembrance for you. Um, it is when the four friends uh, of a paralytic man lower him through the roof and to Jesus' feet so that Jesus can then in turn heal him. Um, and so that's the story that we're going to be talking about today. But I want us to understand as we read this story and as we talk about it afterwards, that, the, that healing and forgiveness go hand in hand with each other. But here's the thing. It's, they don't go hand in hand with each other the way that most of us think that it should, right? Um, and, and we'll, as we go through this study, you'll, he, you'll see why I say that it's not the way that most people think it is. Because when I say that they go together, most of us go back to an ancient understanding. Because it's still kind of prevalent in our society. And that is that deformities, uh, illnesses, ailments, all those physical maladies that is that uh, each of these things that are needing to be healed are actually brought on by sin, okay? And therefore are actually a form of punishment against the person for their acts. And if, you, and if you're starting, if you're, if you're thinking to yourself, well, uh, we, we don't believe that, at some level, we always have believed that, right? You see someone that was speeding down the highway or, you know, was speeding down the highway and got into a car wreck and you sit there and go, you know what, that was because you were speeding. You shouldn't have been speeding, you know, that kind of thing. Or um, uh, you, you see, you're talking to a person who had, and again, it's not the fact that you don't have sympathy for the person, but at the same time, you're sitting there going, you know what, you kind of did this to yourself. You made the choice to speed down the freeway you reap the consequences of those actions by the fact that you got into a wreck. You smoked six packs of cartons of cigarettes a day, and now you're in a bed with, with lung cancer. It goes hand in hand. You made the choice to do it, and you're now reaping the consequences of those choices. And at some level, we understand that. We, we agree with that. Now, as I said, we don't, uh, we don't go to that person in, the, uh, on their, in their beds uh, you know, suffering from lung cancer and say, you know what, you did this to yourself. We don't, do, we don't say that to them because we're nice and we love them and we are able to be sympathetic towards that person and we can love on them and give them grace and give them and pray for them and everything else. But it's still in the back of our minds, isn't it? When we leave the room, when we're talking to our friends, when we're talking with the doctor at the very least, you know, it's like, you know, this this was a foreseeable outcome, right? And we get that with a number of things. And so we have this idea, and that's what I'm saying, is that this is an idea that is still in our society. But as much as this understanding that the physical maladies of our day, the illnesses, the sickness, the, the physical problems that we have, while in some facts we see 
that that understanding is bolstered that it's a punishment for our mistakes, for our actions, for our choices, right? There are plenty of others that, that, that make us really scratch our heads, right? The kid who has the, the five or six year old that has cancer, what choices did that kid make that forced him to have, right? That, it, there are a number of different uh, places and that's a really good example. You know, the, the kid that, that is in, that, that's at MD Anderson or, or whatnot, that, you know, there's nothing that that kid could have done throughout his very short, his or her short life that would have given this disease to that kid, right? Um, or a kid that's in a serious accident. It's easy to see with the kids, right? Uh, that's probably the easiest way to see the, this, um, this whole idea kind of flipped on its head because we all ask the question of why. Why does this happen to such an innocent? Why does this happen to such a good person or whatever the case may be? Um, but then at the same time, when we see these two kind of combating each other, we see the people that, uh, we see people on both sides, then it really does bring to this question, this idea of, well, who does God decide that he's going to help? Who does God decide he's going to heal? Because it seems kind of arbitrary um, who God decides to heal and who he's going to let die, right? Um I'll never forget uh, one of the shows that I really enjoy watching is a is a comedy show called Scrubs. It's about a it, it's a com it's a it's a comedy TV show it was uh, aired back in the late '90s and early 2000s, and um, it was about a bunch of doctors and nurses inside of a hospital. And it was funny, but it had a lot of really cool deep moments as well. Um, and you know, one of the moments, uh, one of the main doctors looks at him as like, you know, statistics don't matter to the person. He says, the reason is because we all know patients who um, come in here with um, horrible cancers throughout their body. And yet, after a while, they walk out because it goes into remission. When all the statistics say that 99% of the time when you find this, this person should have died. And at the same time, we find people that come in for a simple thing um, that they should live 99% of the time and they die. We see these miraculous, we see these stories and the question then becomes, well, how does God decide that this person gets to be healed and this person doesn't? This person gets to walk away from all of this, all the stuff that's going on and this person has to die. Why is it that, that God has this seemingly arbitrary way of extending his healing power because of course we all know and believe that no matter what's going on in our bodies god can heal all of them if we believe that god can heal everything that he can by just his presence by his touch by whatever the case may be he can heal any any ailment then why are some people left alone and why are some healed and that's a question that has plagued humanity for ever, really, um, and certainly has plagued Christianity from the very beginning. So that's what I want us to be thinking about and talking about when we read this passage from Christ uh, and from the gospel according to Mark. So I'm going to read the passage this more, uh, the, today. Uh, it's Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Um, so if you have your study Bible with you, you can uh, turn open to that uh, chapter again. It's Mark 2, uh, verses 1 through 12. So let me read that for you. It says, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Of course, we're talking about Jesus, right? Here we go. Um, so many gathered around that there was, so many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he, Jesus, was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, 
some of the scribes are sitting there and questioning in their hearts. And this is what the heart said. Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins, and here he turns to the paralytics, he says, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And the man stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. It's a long story to read, I know, but it has so much within it that we really need to spend some time to break it down and look at it in a very hard light. So let's first start with the friends, right? The four friends that carry, um, that carry the paralytic man uh, to Jesus's feet, right? Now, first and foremost, I want us to look at the ancient understanding of sins, right? And how ancient, the ancient understanding of sins plays a role in the predicament of this man. The story does not tell us whether the paralytic man is someone who has been paralyzed his entire life, or if it's someone that had a accident and is now paralyzed because of some uh, mistake that he made or an accident that happened while he was uh, doing his duties or anything else. It seems to say that he must have, he may have been someone who was perfectly healthy up until uh, just recently. And the reason that I say that is because it says that he has four friends that are willing to go to this length to help him. Now, what that tells us is that these four people must have known this man at some level, because you're not going to find very many people who are willing to go this far out of their way to help, some, to help a beggar that they don't know, right? To help really anyone that they don't know. Um, because, you know, if, if, the, if the four friends had picked him up and helped him to the door, gotten to the house and realized that the house was completely full, they couldn't get to Jesus, and then decided, you know what, we take him as far as we can and kind of left him there, then I could go ahead and say, you know, yeah, maybe it was just four really good people that really wanted to help him out, but they took him as far as they could and believed that Jesus would take care of it when he left the house the next time, right? Um, would see him and, and, and possibly do something. But these men go so far and beyond and above the call of duty that it, 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 ha it, it tells me that they had to have known him for a lot longer and had loved him. Rather they're, and, and they're not family. That's the other thing. It's because the scripture specifically tells us that they're friends, not family, but friends. So, at some level, we see this understanding of sins playing a role in this predicament in the sense that, um, that the, the question is, what did they risk? You know, because the, these friends, they had to risk something to do what they did for this man. Um, and, and that's why I say that we, I have to believe that the paralytic man's friends are truly people that he had close connection to. They weren't just strangers. They weren't just, uh, to use the scripture term, to, they weren't just good Samaritans that wanted to do something nice. They really were true friends of this man. And so my question, the question that I think we need to start with is, what did they risk to bring this man to Jesus? And the reason that I want us to ask this question is because it does really prove the fact 
that these friends not only cared about this man so much that they were willing to do all of this, but they believed and had faith enough that Jesus could do what he, they wanted him to do, that they were willing to go to this length to be able to have Jesus do what he does. So the first and foremost is that ancient understanding of sins. And the reason that I put so much emphasis on this is because, again, with the ancient understandings, someone who was in sin, someone who had been punished by sin, the punishment does not cleanse. See, this, this is where we, you know, we, we may have a difficulty understanding. We think, okay, he's been punished, so he's now okay. He's living through his punishment. But that's not how it worked. When you were punished, your responsibility was to go clean yourself, to go sacrifice, to go pray, all that kind of stuff. So to say that to, to carry him over was to make yourself unclean. So these men were risking their spiritual health by carrying him to the house instead of carrying him uh, at the very least, you know, if you really wanted to make it so that you were doing the right thing, why wouldn't you take him to the temple? Why wouldn't you take him to the priests? But instead, they take him to this healer. They take him to this Jesus person. And so they contaminate themselves that way. Of course, on top of it, they um, they destroyed property, right? They, they had to cut through a ceiling. <laughs> so they're, you know, they're, they're willing to... To commit to to commit this crime of destruction of property, um, and then there's another question, and and this is one that that's very interesting for us, and it's one that maybe you've never thought of simply because we know Jesus, right? We know that Jesus um, loves all people, takes care of all people, all that kind of stuff. But at this point in time in the story, this is the second chapter. Um, Jesus uh, is still fairly unknown. Um, he's known in the sense that um, it's right after the story of last week with the lepers. So there's a lot of people that have heard this healing story about Jesus, but that's probably about it. And it's still fairly local. So he's not this prominent name or anything else. What if Jesus says no? You know, what happens if they get up to the roof, they cut through the roof, they lower him down on their, on their sashes. And what if Jesus looks up and is like, what the heck are y'all doing? Get this man out of here. What happens if Jesus says that? I, I have to believe that the four friends at least had that thought go through their heads. And they decided that the risk was worth it to get their friend back. For their friend to see Jesus. That was worth the risk. Now, you just heard, I, I hope you heard what that, what that kind of says to us about Jesus and, and how maybe we need to be, how risky we need to be to bring our friends, our family members, our neighbors to Christ, right? Just a, just a small uh, evangelism piece there of how they were, how they risk so much still not knowing that Jesus, you know, as I said, Jesus may have turned his nose up and said, you know what, I'm not helping him. Right? So now the next thing, why were the scribes so upset with the forgiveness of sins? Notice that Jesus forgives them of sins and the scribes and, and the story immediately focuses on the scribes in the room and how they are at the very least whispering to themselves because the whole point is that Jesus is not supposed to hear them. Jesus doesn't hear what they're saying. So in the scripture, it says two things. The first is it says they say it inside their hearts, and Jesus' spirit um, notices that. And the second is that they are talking amongst themselves, which means that at the very least, they are whispering to each other. You know how it happens in large groups of people. There's always some sidebar conversation that's happening, or a couple people that are whispering to each other, and you can hear that but you can't hear exactly what they're saying. And I think that's about where Jesus is in the scribes. They're talking amongst each other for the sole purpose of talking amongst each other so that no one else can hear them. 
And the statements that they're making are absolutely true to the, to the Torah, right? And they're truthful statements. The first is, no one but God can forgive. That is, of course, even we as Christians believe the same thing. No one can forgive sins except God. Now, the difference is we believe that Jesus is God and therefore has the ability to forgive sins. But the scribes didn't know that. The scribes didn't believe him to be God. And so not only has he done something that only God can do, which means that the sins really haven't been forgiven. Uh, keep that in mind. The sins haven't been forgiven. He's just said they have. But they also believe another thing. Nothing but the sacrifices, the rites, and the rituals can purify the person. They had countless rituals and animals that had to be sacrificed and prayers that needed to be said and all this stuff that needed to happen inside the temple. And Jesus has now bypassed all of that. And of course, the scribes that they're going, then what, what about the law of Moses? What about the Torah? What about all of this stuff that says if you do such and such, then you have to do this. If you do this, if you make this mistake or if you sin this way, then you have to sacrifice this animal and pray this prayer and, and, and put yourself in sackcloth for six days or, you know, all this other kind of stuff. There's a lot of requirements. And Jesus has just blown that all to bits and said, nope, don't have to do any of that. I just pronounced you healed. I pronounced you forgiven. Your sins are gone. And Jesus just sits there and says, you're forgiven. And the scribes are sitting there going, wait, 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 wait. What happened to all this stuff? What happened to all this other stuff? It didn't happen in the temple. It didn't happen with priests. It didn't happen with sacrifices. It didn't happen with prayers. And you, sir, are not God. That's what the scribes are thinking. That's what the scribes are talking to each other about. It's like, what are we witnessing? Is this man seriously going to sit in front of an entire house full of people, including the religious elite that are standing there in the scribes, and blaspheme this blatantly? Because that's how the scribes, that's why the scribes were so upset, because that's exactly what's going on in their minds. The scribes don't have a clue as to who Jesus really is. And because they think he's just a teacher, because they think he's just a healer, because they think he's just a man, they can't fathom the fact that he has this power, that he has this kind of authority. Because this is the kind of authority that only God has. And remember what I've said before about the true monotheism of the Jewish faith, especially in the ancient days. God was in charge of all things and it what and he would not he was not going to relinquish or have a proxy. That wasn't how things worked. It was God. He didn't give his power to other people. He didn't lend it out. It was him. He was the one that had to make these choices. And all of a sudden Jesus comes in and starts making these choices. And the scribes are completely out of their element. And they cannot believe what's going on in front of them. So, one thing that I do, uh, another thing that I, I, as we're working our way through this story, I want us to look at the fact that Jesus forgives the man of his sins before he heals the man. This is very, very important to the story. A lot of people will sit there and, and, and they, they just conglomerate the two because it's important that both happen, right? It's important that he was forgiven of his sins, but it's also important that he picks up his mat and walks out of the room, right? Both things are vastly important to the story. And so we tend to just lump the two together of, well, he, he, he healed him and he healed him, right? But it's important for us to really focus on this idea that Jesus forgives the man of his sins first and then he heals the man. And at some level, there is something to be said. And, and the, I think the reason that Jesus does this is there's something to be said about being cleansed on the inside before being healed on the outside. Right? You have a, a cup that 
fell into the pigsty, right? And got uh, cracked and, and broken and whatnot. And you took it inside and you fixed it so that it could hold water again. But you didn't clean the, the cup. Would you really put water in it and start drinking from it? No, of course not. The cup still is not good for drinking. It's still got animal feces on it. It's still got mud and dirt. And, and it's nasty and you don't want it. And that's gross, right? So what do you do first? You take the pieces first. You clean the pieces. And then you put it back together. And now it's not only beautiful to look at, but it's functional. It works. The cleanliness of the inside of the cup makes the healing of the outside uh, the healing of the cup mean something and for humans it's the same thing you can heal a person's physical body but if their heart is still screwed up if their if their soul is still uh, you know dark darkened then what good is the is the healthy physical body all it's going to do is allow the the badness the sin to multiply even further, to become even greater. But if you eliminate the darkness first and then heal the body, then all of a sudden the body has the opportunity to truly become the hands and feet of Christ, right? If you don't clean the inside first, before you heal the outside of the body, you run the risk of what Jesus calls the, the religious elite. Remember, when Jesus and the religious elite, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, are, are on the temple steps, and Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs, whitewashed sepulchers. And the reason he does this is because he says that y'all are beautiful on the outside. You got all your ornamentation, you got your uh, bright robes, you got your gems and jewels. You look fantastic and you speak fantastically, but inside you are rotting. He's talking about a tomb. He's talking about uh, on the outside, it looks beautiful and gorgeous. But if you open the door, you're going to find rotting flesh inside. And that's what he calls the religious leap. And I think that's what Jesus is really saying. He says, what, he says you know, to the man, I'm going to heal your inside first. I'm going to heal your sin. I'm going to heal your spirit first so that then your body can take care of things. Now, the question that I have, and we'll talk about this in, in a second, because it's a very important question. Was Jesus going to leave the man paralyzed? It's an interesting question of the story, right? Because Jesus first, the first thing he says, he, he sees the man lowered down. He sees him on the, on the ground and he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And it's at that point, the story cuts away to the scribes and the interaction of Jesus and the scribes. And Jesus looks at them and he says, which is easier to forgive a man of his sins or to ask him to ask a paralytic man to stand up and walk. And he says, but to, uh, to answer your, to, to make sure that you know that I am who I say I am, then I'm also going to heal him and have him get up and walk out. And that's what he said, you know, turns to the paralytic and says, get up and walk, take, take him out and walk. So my question, the question that I actually have this, one of the big questions that I have in this story is, was without the scribes being there, was Jesus just going to sit there and go, your son, your sins are forgiven. Okay, take him back up. Yeah, you know, is, was Jesus really prepared to just leave him there, to leave him as a paralytic man, even though he had forgiven him of his sins? It's, it, we'll talk about that in a, in, towards the end of the, of the lesson today, but it's an interesting question that I want you to really kind of write down and ponder um, as we as we turn uh, one th one other thing um, to, to the last piece of this, and that is how the people respond to this healing, because we see Jesus not only forgive the man, but then, of course, we have the miraculous event of the man standing up, taking his mat and walking out the front door. Um, and the crowd's response, the way that the people respond is, is, is exactly the way they're supposed to, right? Because what do they do? It says, so that they were all amazed and they what? And they glorified God. Notice 
who they're worshiping, right? They don't glorify Jesus. They don't say, oh my gosh, you're so amazing. No, they glorify God. They don't glorify Christ. They don't glorify the friends. They don't glorify the scribes or the Pharisees or anyone else. They don't, they don't glorify anyone else. They focus their attention on God, the being who allowed the healing to happen, right? Now, let me ask the question, how do you think that reaction differs from the reaction that we would have Today, if we were in church today and this kind of thing happened, someone came in that was paralyzed or sick or whatnot, and they were raised up, what would happen in our society if that happened? I can tell you exactly what would happen. That pastor, and if it happened in our church, myself, I would all of a sudden become this social media massive uh, advertising, right? This man is a healer. Bring your sick, bring your uh, paralyzed, bring bring your people that have maladies to him, and he's going to lay hands on them, and he's going to he's going to bless them, and they're going to be healed. Any of that talk about God? No, of course not. What about someone who who has a miraculous uh, healing inside the hospital? What do we do? We praise the doctors for their wisdom and their expertise. We praise the the staff, the nurses and the staff for the exquisite job that they did. We praise science for the miraculous advances that have come out and all the scientists that, that worked and everything else. We, we praise all this stuff. But isn't it God who granted all of that stuff to begin with? Shouldn't he be the one that receives all the glory? Not just some of it, not just a statement of, well, thank God that this happened and thank God, you know, and, and thank God that this happened and thank, uh, thank the doctors for all of their work and thank this. Da, 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 da. Isn't it God that did all of that? Isn't it God that gave the intellect and the wisdom to the doctor to become a doctor? Isn't it God who gave the talents and the abilities to the scientists to do all of their work so they could advance the field of medicine? Isn't it the doctors? Isn't it, the, isn't it God that gave the nurses and the techs, the uh, patients and the ability to do their job? Shouldn't God be the only one that's given glory? Because I think that's the other thing that I really enjoy, uh, I, I really focus on this at that point, is that the people don't split their glory. They don't split their attention. They don't say, oh, glory be to God and glory be to you, Jesus, for doing what you did. Or glory be to God and glory be to the friends who, who, lowered, him, uh, who lowered him down. No, all glory is given to God. Is that something that we do in our, in today in our society when that kind of thing happens? Probably not. Right? So I'm going to go back a little bit to that to that question of what would Jesus was Jesus really going to just heal or forgive the man of his sins instead of healing him as paralytic. And the reason that I'm going to go back to this question is because it brings up another question. What does it mean to be healed spiritually? I think all of us can understand what it means to be healed physically. You know, the physical physical malady or illness or whatever is gone. So what does it mean when we talk about being healed spiritually? And I think in light of this passage, we have to conclude that being healed by Christ does not always mean being physically healed. Because again, I want us to go back to that question of, was Jesus really intending on stopping the healing at the spiritual? Was he really intending on saying, my son, your sins are forgiven, and that's it. But until, until the scribes and the rest of the people needed to see the physical healing in order for them to truly understand, comprehend, and believe in the spiritual healing that Jesus had just extended to him. And I think about this, and I look in the scriptures, and I find a number of different examples. Uh, Paul and his prayers about God removing the thorn from his side. You remember that from the book of Acts. We remember uh, in, in Exodus, in the beginning of the book, Bible with Moses, who had a speech impediment, who had multiple excuses as to why, and I, I wouldn't even say excuses, multiple reasons as to why he shouldn't be the spokesperson for God, as to why he shouldn't be the one that had to go into Egypt and go to Pharaoh and 
ask for God, ask for Pharaoh to let the slaves go, to let the Israelite people go. And yet God uses both of these men to do great and wonderful things. And he uses the same thing throughout the scriptures. He finds those people that aren't good enough, the people that aren't the, the, what, the, what the society says should be. And he doesn't take away their weakness. He doesn't take away their, their, their injury or their illness or their, or their uh, deficiency. Instead, he magnifies his glory by the mere fact that he is able to do amazing things with someone who was deficient, who was less than, who was not the perfect, or what society would say would be the perfect candidate. And at some level, I have seen so many people as I've done hospital visits and whatnot, I've seen so many people that had that inner peace while they were lying on their deathbeds. When God said no to the physical healing of their bodies. And of course, you know, those that are around them are praying for uh, physical healing and, and for God to reach out and, and, to, and to touch them and to take care of what's going on and let them get out of bed and, and, and let them, you know, go back to their, their normal li everyday lives and go back to their families and friends and everything else. But I've seen so many people that have this inner peace while they're lying on their deathbeds when God has obviously and definitively said no to the healing of the body. And when I read, and, and I told you that this study comes from a book by Max Lucado, and in the book there's a couple passages that I want to read because Max has a wonderful way of, of putting things uh, putting things down into words. So I wanted to read this passage for you that talks about what's going on in this passage and how we can really experience spiritual healing um, as apart from the physical healing. And it starts with the idea of the friends and their faith in Jesus, their faith in, and their desire to help their friend. Because he says that it was risky when they decided to go up to the roof, right? They could fall. It was dangerous. He could fall, the, the paralytic man. He could fall when, as they were getting up there. It was unorthodox. They were de-roofing a house. That's very antisocial. It was intrusive. Jesus was obviously very busy. They could, it was very obvious that they didn't, and that this was going to be intrusive on his time and his space, but it was their only chance to see Jesus. So they take the man and they climb up to the roof. Faith is what does these things. Faith does the unexpected and faith is what gets God's attention. This is the, this is the, the final piece. His friends wanted him, Jesus, to heal their friend, but Jesus won't settle for a simple healing of the body. He wants to heal the soul. He leapfrogs the physical and deals with the spiritual to heal. And, and this is why to heal the body is temporal, but to heal the soul is eternal. And Max says, all of heaven must pause as another burst of love declares the only words that really, truly matter. Your sins are forgiven. This is what Jesus tells the man. Your sins are forgiven. Now, when I read this passage of scripture, as I read those words from Max, and I read this passage of scripture from Mark, I'm reminded that the physical healing was a healing that was meant for the crowd, not for the paralytic man. And here's the reason why this is so important and why I want us to really focus on it and end here and why I want to hammer this point home because this is something that, that even I, ha I struggle with a lot. Um, because let me ask you, how you would have felt about this story if it truly ended at that point. If it truly ended with the, the, the friends lowering the man down to Jesus' feet, Jesus looking at the man, looking up at the friends, having pity in his heart and seeing the faith of his friends and looking at them and looking at him and saying, my son, your sins are forgiven, and then looked back up and, and, and that was it. That the story ended right there. It didn't end with and get up and walk away. It ended with your sins are forgiven. Now raise him back up, right? 
I think that for almost every single one of us, the story would lose its potency, its power. It would still be miraculous. We'd still worship God. And I'm not saying that we wouldn't, but it, the story would seem like it was halfway finished, right? That there was something else that should have happened in that scene because we're expecting that the physical healing is going to happen. But the, the fact is, is that us desiring that ending is more of a problem of our own faiths than a problem of the story because it means that we're too focused still on the physical than on the spiritual. Now, of course, I don't want Jesus to be callous. I don't want Jesus, um, I don't want us to look, to, to look in on a, on a dying or injured person and saying that their suffering isn't really suffering. Um, you know, I, I don't want that to happen, but Jesus continuously asks his audience. He continuously points us towards the spiritual, towards the kingdom. He wants us to focus our attention and our eyes on the kingdom of God that is breaking into the world, not the world. He wants us to focus on the thing that's breaking into the world. And so when I read this story and think of how amazing it was that Jesus told the man to get up and walk, my question is, if that's what we're focused on, has my focus been diverted? Have I lost the true miracle of what happened in that room? Because the true miracle of what happened in that room is not the fact that he got up, took his mat, and walked out of the room. The true miracle happened in the simple words, my son, your sins are forgiven. You are now in right relationship with the creator of the entire universe. You don't need anything else but that. Our, is our focus, is our focus still on the physical? And the second thing, I, the second point that I want to make about this story the physical healing, the fact that Jesus tells the man, get up, take your mat, and walk out, that was the easy part. <laughs> we tend to think that it was probably the hardest part because when we look at it, we think, okay, it's easy to say the words, you are forgiven. It's, we know how difficult it would be or almost near impossible it would be, even with our medical expertise and all of the money and everything else that you could throw at it, to take a man who was paralyzed and have him walk away. Years of physical therapy, of, uh, of, uh, of spine, spinal surgeries, and all this other kind of stuff. I don't even know if it's necessarily possible, but in our medical profession, even if it was possible, we also know that it would take forever for a man to finally walk after he'd been paralyzed. And so we sit there and think, think okay, it has to be easier for him to say, your sins are forgiven, than it is for him to tell the man, get up and walk. That's the, 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 the mind-blowing part, right? But the fact is that Jesus highlights this for the scribes, and he highlights it for the crowd and for us. When he looks to the scribes and says, which is easier, to say to the paralytic man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk? Which is the easiest one? And what he's trying to get us to understand is that the easier one is for Jesus to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk out. Because here's the thing. Physical healing is easy for God. He's the one that created us. He created everything in the cosmos in six days, right? He spoke us into being. If you think that it's going to be any harder for him to heal a broken spine or to rid you of cancer or anything else, you're delusional. Of course, that's the easy thing for God. I'm not saying that he always does it, but I'm saying that it's the easy thing for him. But what does it cost to forgive sins? His blood, his death. That's what it costs to say your sins are forgiven. It takes the ultimate sacrifice. But so many times our eyes focus on the physical, don't they? 
we read this story and it's like, oh my goodness gracious. It was so amazing that that man was able to just, he had been paralyzed for so long and he just gets up, picks up his mat and walks out the front door. How incredible is that? But that's not the incredible part. The incredible part is that Jesus sits there and says, your sins are forgiven. You are healed. Your spirit is healed. And it goes back to that statement that I made. How many times have we known someone who has been sick and we pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and they die? And one of the first questions that we ask is, why did God not heal them? Why did God not do what he, what we know he has the ability to do? Why doesn't he do what we know that he has the ability to do? Why doesn't he heal them? And we forget that the most important and the most impressive and the most amazing healing happens without us knowing it and without us noticing. It. The physical healing is the easy part. But the healing of the soul, that cost him crucifixion. That's what we got today. Um, why don't we close the word of prayer? And then uh, I look forward to seeing y'all at church on Sunday. Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. It is so difficult for us sometimes to not focus on the physical because it's so easy for us to see. It's so easy for us to, to see when the cancer doesn't, doesn't return or when it goes away, when the bone heals, when the... Uh, the, the terminal patient is able to walk away from the hospital. All of these things are so easy for us to see. And when we do see them, Father, help us to make sure that our glory that we give, all the praise that we, set, that we heap up is all going to the right source. That are, They're all going to you because you are the one. You are the source of all healing. You are the one who allows all of that to happen. You are the one that answers the prayers. And Father, help us when those answers come back of no. To remember that they have been saved. That the most important healing is one that we cannot see, but that comes in the spirit. Help us pray for that above all other healings, not only for ourselves, but for our friends, our families, our neighbors, the stranger, and the enemy. So that all of humanity might be reconciled. And we pray all this in Christ's precious name. Again, brothers and sisters, I look forward to seeing you at church on Sunday morning, 9 o'clock or 1045 for our services. And if, if you can't meet for the gathering, don't forget to put this into your calendar every Thursday at noon right here on Zoom to be part of Lunch for the Pastor. We'll continue the Gospel of Mark next week. I look forward to it and God bless you all.